and forever. We're going to start out this year. Matthew chapter number 6. Right smack dab in the middle of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter number 6. <clears throat> Maybe if I get there. Verse number 24. No man can serve two masters. Well, that's a good place to start this year. Amen. Amen. For he either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they so not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet that your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than them? Now what Jesus is teaching us here is, you've got to put your faith in Jesus. God knows what's better for you than you do. And where we mess it up at is when we do like Abraham did and we interject ourselves into the situation. Yes. When in all reality, what God wants you to do is what he said in the Old Testament, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes you just got to step back from away from situations in your life. Put your hands up and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I'm going to trust you. You see, it's when we try to fix it, and when we try to put our, our knowledge into it and try to put ourselves into situations, we can get ourselves in a bind. But Jesus is teaching us here that we got to put, if you're going to live for him, you got to put your faith and your trust in him. He asked you, he said, he said, aren't you better than the fowls of the air? He created you out of the dust. He spoke most things, but he created you and breathed life into you. You are far more better than these things. Verse 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? No matter what you do, you can't add to yourself. You can't make yourself grow taller. You make can make yourself grow wider. <laughs> But what he's talking about, your, your stature, your position in life, you, you can't grow your position in life. God's the only one that can put you up and pull you back down. Yes, he can. And as long as you put yourself in God's hands, when he elevates you, I'm going to be happy about it. But when he brings me back down, I'm still going to be happy about it because it's where God wants me. Because uh, ultimately, it's not what I want and it's not how I feel about it, but it's about doing the will of God. Yes. Even when we slip and we fall, we think the world's falling apart. we got to think to ourselves, what's God trying to do to me to put me in? He may bring you all the way down because you're the only person that can reach somebody at the bottom. Verse 28, and why take ye thought for raiment? Your clothes, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no fault, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? All of these things. Don't even think about it. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Those that don't live for God. They're always worried about themselves. 
For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. God already knows what you need, church. But here's the kicker. This is, this is where I want to go right here, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things, somebody say things, things will be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for, for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. And that's where I want to go for the year of 2022. God first. Yes. If we can seek God first. I'm going to tell you, all, all these things we worry about and all these things that get us all upset and frustrated and all of that, if we'll put God first, yes. He'll take care of every situation. He'll take care of every situation. Lift your hands and just love him for a moment. Thank you. I love you this morning. Bless you for the name of the Lord, my God, my King Jesus. Here we got in this place. We praise you in this house. Touch your anointing, your help. God Almighty, Jesus, Lord, touch our ears. Praise God. You can be seated. Go ahead and put the title up there, Brother Hall. Seek ye first the kingdom. Or say kingdom. Kingdom. Now, in this scripture here, there's a lot going on in this sermon that Jesus preached. And, and, and in this particular part where we read from today, Jesus is, is teaching that you've got to have faith in God. And life's not always going to be what you want. And life's always going to uh, throw you curveballs and mess with you and uh, uh, make you see things unclearly. But what he's saying is if you'll put God first, and in verse number 33... We realize real quickly that he says, seek the kingdom. And if you're going to seek, that word means to actively look. Anybody ever played hide and go seek? I mean, that's, that, that game's as old as all of us in here. The object of the game is for one person to hide their eyes and count. And everybody else to go hide. And then when the person that gets done counting... What does he say? Ready or not? Here I come. Now, anybody ever play hide and go seek with somebody? It gets done counting, look around, don't see nobody, and then they just sit there and go. Now, I know we all play with those type of people. Maybe you, if you hadn't, maybe you was that person. You look around, you don't see nobody, and you get mad because you're it, and you can't go hide. That word seek means to act to actively go and look. So when that person says, ready or not, here I come, they actually began to look. They're looking under stuff and in the bushes. And they're actively looking for somebody so that they can tag them and they can be it. Because they don't want to be it anymore. So in order to do that, you have to actively seek and, and, and find and look under stuff and over stuff and through stuff. And you've got to pick stuff up and you've got to look under covers and, 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 and behind barn doors and behind houses and, and under buildings. You have to actively seek. And that's the same way God wants us with His feet. We just can't sit on a pew and expect God to drop everything into our... I know that's the way we like to pray. And I'm going to blame it on the charismatic movement. It's called glad and gray. God bless you. God give it to me. God do it. And then we get mad at God because he don't do what we ask him to do. When we've been sitting on our bum and ain't prayed one time. So actively seeking is actually making an effort to look for the kingdom of God. And how do you actively seek? Pray. Somebody say pray. 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 If I'm going to search God, Brother Watson, there's two things I've got to do. I've got to pray to get in contact with Him. And I've got to read to find out who He is. Let me tell you, you want to know what God is and who He is and what He stands for? Get in the book. That's it. You want to find out what God believes? How he wants you to live, how he wants you to react, how he wants you to do. It's in the book. And, 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 and when you're associated with somebody that, that doesn't do it this way, don't let them fool you. 
You got to get in the book. <coughs> but we're going to talk about first today is, is, in seeking is prayer. What is the kingdom? What's the kingdom of God? Peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, the Bible gives it to us, doesn't it? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Hey, I love fellowship. I love hanging out. I love uh, eating and drinking and all of that stuff. But that's not the kingdom of God. It's not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. So if you're going to actively seek the kingdom of God, you've got to understand what the kingdom of God is. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. Today I want to focus on seek. Now, notice in verse 33, he says, Seek ye the kingdom, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. There's, there's a dual, dual thing here. So just coming to church, sitting on a pew, clapping your hands a few times, that's not seeking the kingdom of God. There's got to be something active in your life. You can't be stagnant. You can't be. Palm water gets disgusting because it's stagnant. Anybody ever filled up a swimming pool and you didn't turn the filter on? It doesn't take but a couple of days. It's green, it's nasty, and the frogs are in it. That's kind of the way our spirit gets when we don't pray. We're not activating and seeking God. We get stagnant. And then amphibians come in and, and, and snakes and things begin to come in and grow in there. And we can't get it out. And the only way to get it out is to shut it is to dump some chlorine in it and to get it. But that's why the Bible says, uh, does it say that the kingdom of God, it, it's going to be a, a pond water flowing out of you. No, it's going to be rivers of living water because flowing water cleans itself. So if you don't have nothing coming in and going out and moving and shaking, you're going to get stagnated. Boy, I ain't even got my notes yet. But in 2022, on this very first service, we got to understand something today that if we want to build a church here, we got to learn to pray yes. and seek the face of God. Amen. That's why there's a prayer log out there. And that's why we ought to be signing that thing. We ought to be coming in this place and praying and making this house the house of prayer. Let me tell you, the most important building in this entire community is the house of God. And if there's not prayer coming from this house, saturating the community, the devils of hell are not afraid of a church that don't pray. So we got to learn to seek the kingdom. And that's righteousness, doing the right thing. Creating peace and having joy. And when you find people that, 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 that can't have peace, they don't have joy, and they're not doing the right thing, they don't have the Holy Ghost. And it's not your job to go fix them and correct them. It's your job to pray. 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 So we got to seek the kingdom. Prayer is one of the greatest privileges of a child of God. The greatest privilege you have uh, in your life is prayer. It's direct communication to the king. Direct communication with God. Luke 21, verse 29 through 36. I, I think I gave you this. And he spake to them a parable. Jesus spoke to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged, with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of life, and so that and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Here's the kicker. But watch ye therefore and pray, pray always. always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Let me tell you, the only way you're going to escape the enemy of this world <clears throat> is to pray. 
That's it. If you, so let me just be blunt. Y'all ready? Let me just be pastor for a minute. If you ain't praying, you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> when I say pray, I'm not talking about Lord bless my food. Now let me down to sleep. Thank you, Jesus, for everything and go to sleep. I'm not talking about 32 second prayers. I'm not talking about Lord touch and Lord bless them. I'm talking about a direct relationship with God where you bury your face in your pillow or your carpet or somewhere. And there's something about coming to the house of God and burying your face in the carpet at the house of God and saturating the house of prayer with prayer. Because if you don't learn to pray, you will never make it. Oh, can, can you come to church without praying? Yeah. Can you be okay? Yeah, because, it, Sister Gabby, it, it, it becomes um, uh, just a place. It becomes a lifestyle to us because well, on Sunday we're just supposed to go to church and we just go there. But if you're not praying, when life overwhelms you, you will not make it. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said, church. All this stuff's going to come out of you. Serving and drunkenness and all this stuff. And if you don't watch and watch for it when it comes to attack you, and if you're not praying, pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Life's got a funny way of overwhelming us sometimes. And you'll find out where people stand. And if they got a prayer life, when all hell breaks loose and you find them at an altar saying, God, I don't understand why my dad's got cancer. I don't understand why she's got to have a kidney transplant. I don't understand it, God, but I'm still going to come to an altar and I'm still going to pray. And God, you may take them from us, but I'm still going to give you glory. I don't understand, God. God, but you're going to find me at an altar and you're going to find me with my hands lifted, praising and shouting. You know why? Because I don't live for God by the accolades of people and what he's done for me. I live for him because I love him. Do you love this morning? Yes, the greatest privilege you could have is prayer. In some instances, it is also one of the most neglected weapons that God has given us. Right. By which we war against the flesh and the devil. The greatest thing God has given you is your prayer life. Right. Yes. We got to learn to pray. I'm, I'm convinced that if we saturate this and Make this place. Jesus went in and flipped tables over. And he said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And if we learn today. That if we can create this place. Make this place today the house of prayer. Today in 2022. Every moment I get, I'm coming to pray. Every chance I get, I'm coming to pray. You know why? Because when you began to shake the foundations of this community. Miracles can, be, can begin to take place. <laughs> you may not believe it, but I'm going to tell you, prayer changes things. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm going to tell you something. The flesh is powerful. Anybody ever wrestled your flesh? <laughs> you know how to keep that flesh in check? tougher and the harder it gets, the more we got to pray. We blame, I'm going to tell you, we blame too much on the devil. Jesus went 40 days fasting. The devil took him up on top of that mount and began to try to convince him of things. Speak to him. We'll tell you, the devil will speak to you. And he'll whisper in your ear. But there's a motto that I live by that's helped me, Brother Watson. It's helped me living for God when it, when it comes to the devil and it comes to people. It's like this. Believe nothing you hear and only half of what you see. Because I'm going to tell you, thing, not all things are always as they appear. 
And if you only get half of a story, you create a judgment based on half of a story. Because I'm going to tell you, it's human nature. You do what I do, we all do. We're only going to tell our part and make us look good. But Jesus got took up on top of that mount uh, with, with, with Lucifer, with Satan. And Satan began to speak to him. But Jesus knew enough of the word and he had a prayer life that he could combat the enemy. I'll tell you, prayer works. Prayer works. Believe nothing you hear. Only half of what you see. The only thing that we can take at face value is Yes. That's right. Word of God. The preached Word of God also. And I'm going to tell you, you've got an obligation. When I stand up here and I break the bread and I preach to you, you've got an obligation to make sure I'm right. <laughs> because anybody can go sit in any church today and listen to a preacher and just believe, well, the they, preacher wouldn't lie to me. I, I beg to differ to you. I'm going to tell you, though. We've got an obligation. Anyway, Jesus, the devil lied to him. The devil tried to deny him. And Jesus went 40 days with him. And he used the word against him. See, the devil entices. That's all he does. Just like he done with Jesus. He, he enticed him. Oh, 40 days. Hey, why don't you take this stone and turn it into bread? I know you're hungry. He enticed him. Well, the word says, a man shall not live by bread alone, but every word, word that comes from where? The mouth of God. Guess what the mouth of God is? And guess what God chose to be the mouthpiece of God? Your pastor. Not just preachers. A pastor. You gotta have a pastor. And problem I have with Facebook is, and I've said this before, y'all know, too many people get on Facebook, think they call to preach, and they try to preach to people on Facebook and they twist everything up. And you got people following Facebook preachers and TV preachers and, and radio preachers and all of that, and the pastor can get up here and just pre preach something straight up and you won't believe it because you heard something different from somebody else. But God has chosen the shepherd, the watchman on the wall, the pastor to come in and break the bread and become the mouthpiece of God. We do not live by bread alone, but every word that cometh out of the mouth of God. Bless him, Lord. Bless him, Jesus. The devil entices, just like he did with Jesus. He's just enticing. Look at all this king. Look at all, uh, look at all this stuff I'll give you if you just move here. Do this. Change this. Fix this. Hey, if you let down on this standard, I'll give you all of this. You don't really have. And, and he entices. But let me tell you, all the devil can do is entice you. But if you're not praying to where you need to be, the devil entices. It's your flesh that he has. When he walked into the, gar to, into the Garden of Eden, all he done was enticed Eve. It was Eve's flesh that reacted. You want to find out where somebody is spiritually? Watch how they react. <laughs> Watch how they react when the music's going on and the worship's going on. Look, look how they react when the altar call happens and the preached word of God goes forth. You'll find out where they stand and who they are. You see, because the, all the enemy can do is entice you, but it's your flesh that reacts to it. A lot of things can be remedied by the reaction. Paul said it in Romans chapter 7, and this is one of, one of my favorite um, uh, parts of Scripture here. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, so under shit. I'm a carnal. You ever repeat yourself? You can't get out of this flesh. Your flesh. That means you've got to fight it every day. You've got to fight it every day. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. Make a lot of sense to you, blah, blah, blah. But what I hate is that I do. God, I don't want to be 
be addicted anymore. God, I don't want to uh, be a garbage guy. God, I don't want this to happen. But you know what? It seems like I just do it. I don't want to, God. I don't want to. But for then I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I can't, I just can't seem to do it. You know what Paul's saying here in Romans? The reason why this happens to you. And, and, and the problem is we, don't, we can't ever fix it because we don't want to admit to ourselves we just got sin in our life. When you find yourself wanting to do right, but you can't do it. Or not wanting to do bad, you just keep doing bad. And you can't control yourself, you don't know why. Paul gave us the remedy right here. The reason why you have a problem is there's sin in your life. And until you bring it to an altar and get it right, you're going to struggle the rest of your life. And it gets to the point where the struggle becomes God's fault. Because <clears throat> God had not swept in. You see, we have a misconception of who God is thanks to all those TV preachers and all that stuff we're talking about a while ago. We think that, that when we slip and fall, God's supposed to be this great big thing that swoops in, pats us on the back, lifts us up, and tells us it's okay. No, Paul spoke to us and told us that when we have problems like that, we got sin. And the only remedy for sin is an altar of repentance. And God's just not going to swoop in and stand you back up and pat you on the back, kiss you on the cheek and say, keep on sinning because I died for you and I love you. No, He wants you to go to an altar of repentance and say, whoa, it's me, God. I don't understand it, God, but there's something in my life I need to get right. Then God shows up. Then He forgives. Then He picks you up. We've got a misconception in the world today and in the church that has crept into the apostolic church. We have a misconception today that God is just this, this, this big teddy bear up there loving everybody and it don't matter what you do or how you react or how you talk about your brother, where you go and what you do, God's just going to love you through it. Yeah, He loves you, but He chastises those that He loves. Amen. Anybody ever got a whooping when you was a kid? Anybody ever gave your kids whippings? Why'd you do that? Because you hate them? They may think that. Because you love them. And you want them to do right. We've got to get it out of our head that God's just going to come in and fluff us up and fluff our pillow and help us sleep real good when we got sin in our lives. You know what sin does? Sin separates you from God. <clears throat> God's waiting on you to repent. I'm telling you, he's standing there waiting. He's standing there waiting to jump in and help and fix if you go to an altar and say, okay, God, I can't do it anymore. But until you do, what you do when you got sin in your life is you're keeping God from rescuing you. And then when God don't show up when we want to, we blame God. When all he's doing is saying, just repent. Just ask for forgiveness. Bible says, confess and forsake. He's faithful and just to forgive. Yes, he, is. he is jumping at the opportunity to wrap his arms around you and put you right back where you're supposed to be. Thank you. That's why we need to build a prayer line. I said that's why we need to build a prayer line. It's highly recommended and commanded by Jesus Christ himself. Luke chapter 18 and verse number 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. I'm going to tell you, when you party more than you pray, you're going to lose. That's right. When you sleep. Anybody ever went to pray and you fell asleep? It happens. We almost did that around here New Year's Eve night. I'm going to tell you though, Elder Hall, we had a prayer meeting around here too. New Year's Eve night. We prayed in the new year. All of you that was here, thank you so much for coming. And I got a phone call from a couple of you that said you couldn't be here. But I understand. 
I'm going to tell you something. You'll find out. Kingdom first. You'll find out where people lie and where people are when it comes to prayer. Prayer is an important part of how we relate to God. You cannot have a relationship with God without a prayer life. And you can't have a relationship with anybody if you don't talk. We can't treat prayer like a spare tire and just pull it out when we need it. See, I, I'm afraid that's what we do with, with prayer so many times. We think we pray because we say, I love you, Jesus, every now and again. Or God bless his food. Or... But when we hit the bind and have a blowout and we're stuck on the side of the road, then we want to go to God. Was it the seven sons of Sceva who tried to pray for people who tried to do? Was it the seven sons of Sceva? Yeah. yeah. Try to cast out the devil. Try to cast out the devil by by Jesus uh, and Paul preaching. Right. And what did that devil say mm -hmm. to those sons? He said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are you? And I don't know about you, but I want the spiritual powers of this area to know my voice. I want them to know who I am. And if I'm going to grow in God, I've got to get a prayer life. I want every devil in hell to know where Faywell Pentecostal Church is. When we turn this place into the house of prayer. You see, when we treat prayer like a spare tire and we only pull it out, you know those ones that's under your vehicle, you gotta unwind it out, it's full of dirt and dust. Maybe flat, you don't even know if it's if it's got air in it, and you try to you, you you're on the side of the road, you have to blow out, you're in a hurry, you're trying to go do something, but now you have to pull that tire out and you gotta put that spare on and that and if we treat prayer like that, and we only try to use it when we need it. When 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 everything breaks loose in our house and our home and, and things are going crazy and and, and, and just our mind is, is saddled with stuff. And if that's when we decide to pray, I'm afraid you'll find out real quickly that the spirits begin to say, I don't even know who you are. But when I have a blowout, Sister Hall, and I need God to come to my rescue, I want him to know. That when I get down and say, hey, Jesus, he goes, is that Brother Whitmer? <laughs> I know that voice! <laughs> I gave him power and dominion and authority over the place that he's at. And I can hear his voice so that when he begins to pray, I stand at attention and I go see what he needs. And I send my angels down to fight his battles. You know why? The angel Michael went and fought for them. He told Daniel, he said, I heard you the first moment that you prayed. And I began to fight your battles the very moment you, you know why he did that? Because Daniel went and prayed every day, every day, every day. And the spiritual world knew his voice. Does God know your voice tonight, this morning, church? Does God know your voice because when I get down to pray and I've got a dilemma or a situation I need God to intervene in I want him to be willing to step in because he already knows who I am <coughs> stand with me this morning 
I'm gonna cut it short. I got one little, about five lines in. <clears throat> Kingdom first. You'll find out real quick where people <clears throat> put first. <clears throat> You know, many religions recognize the need for prayer. And it's sad when the Muslims can out pray the Christians. And we serve the God that can open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, cast devils out, dry up leprosy, heal cancer, create new kidneys. That's the God that I serve. He'll know it if I put his kingdom. You see, I don't I don't worry anymore, Sister Gaylene. God taught me a lesson when I got in that wreck. I, I don't worry anymore about what God's going to do and how he's going to do it. That's his job. My job is just to pray and to seek his face. Put his kingdom first. That means if I'm living for God and I'm part of his kingdom, that when there's something going on in the kingdom, at the house of prayer, I'm going to be at the house of prayer. I'm going to put his kingdom first. Come on, why don't we make our way to these altars? Somebody needs to pray this morning.